Hello everyone, this is your boy Ed, and today I'm wrapping up our two-part series on carbohydrates. The last thing that we talked about in the first part of this series was animers. In order to distinguish one animer from another animer, we look at the hydroxyl group at the C1 carbon, or the anomeric carbon. If the hydroxyl group is oriented in the same way as the C5CH2OH group, or cis, then we have the beta animer. By contrast, if the hydroxyl group is on the other side of the ring, then we have a trans relationship, thereby giving us the alpha anomer. Now, let me convert these Hawthorne projections to wedge dash conformations, just because this is the format we're going to be using for the duration of this video. Okay, now that we have a working understanding of the terminology and the structures, we can move forward with that problem we had at the beginning of the first video, wherein we're trying to synthesize isobemios, the trisaccharide made in that fictitious bacterium. First, let's identify the glycosidic linkage in tree halos. Notice the first part of this ether linkage is below the plane of the ring compared to the C5 functional group. They're trans to one another, making it an alpha linkage. Now let's look at the other side of this glycosidic linkage. It has the same orientation, the same trans relationship to the C5 methoxy group. This makes it an alpha-alpha linkage. Now when we look at where the carbons are connected to the ether, we have an alpha-alpha-1-1 one, one glycosidic linkage. Now, let's classify the glycosidic linkage in isobemios. We have that same trans relationship we saw in tree halos, but when you look at the second half of the glycosidic bond, it appears to be cis. So, we have an alpha-beta-1-6 glycosidic linkage. Excellent. We know how to differentiate between different glycosidic linkages. Let's get down to the mechanism by which they are formed. We will begin our mechanism with our friend beta-D-glucose. Notice that we don't have any hydroxyl groups. Rather, we have OR groups, which are just very general protecting groups in order to keep the hydroxyl groups from reacting during our glycosylation. Also notice that the anomeric carbon, we have a thiophenyl group. This is because we are using beta-D-glucose as our glycosyl donor. So... In other words, during glycosylation, this thiophenyl group will act as a leaving group so we can easily attach the two sugars together. To make our leaving group even better, we're going to add NIS, or n iodosacinamide It's going to donate its iodine atom to our leaving group, thus making it more polarizable. Lastly, we're going to add a Lewis acid, or triflic acid, at this point, and we're going to see that once all these guys are stirring in a beaker, the lone pair on our sulfur atom, it's going to definitely want to snag the iodine in a nucleophilic attack. We're going to see a chain reaction of electrons being moved from the iodine-nitrogen bond back to the direction of the ketone, and therein the nucleophilic ketone is going to steal a hydrogen from our Lewis acid. This will give you yield to a very interesting intermediate wherein our oxygen is going to kick some electrons back to the positive sulfur, thereby resulting in a, another intermediate. I've drawn both resonance structures here to give you a full idea of what is occurring during this mechanism. This is wherein our second sugar comes in handy. The, we're going to have one hydroxyl group that is going to be unprotected on our tree halos or the red disaccharide from this example earlier. And it is an example of a glycosyl acceptor. The glycosyl acceptor is the sugar that has an unprotected hydroxyl group. This hydroxyl group can attack the glycosyl donor either from the bottom face or the top face yielding an alpha or beta linkage. It's worth mentioning that this intermediate that the, the glycosyl donor becomes is the oxocarbenium ion. Yeah, that's a six dollar word. Organic chem is absolutely chock full of them. Once this attack occurs, and once our nucleophilic hydroxyl group drops a hydrogen atom, we're going to have one of our products. Notice that the bond is on the same side as that C5 group, thereby giving us a beta linkage. We'll have another product wherein the bond is on the opposite side of that C5 group, thereby giving us, you guessed it, the alpha linkage. Now, depending on what type of protecting group you have on the hydroxyl groups, this is going to influence 
the predominance of one linkage over the other in a glycosylation. Now notice we have that same beta D-glucose with a thiophenyl group except for the hydroxyl groups have an acetyl protecting group on them. I'm going to skip a few steps. I realize that just for time's sake, our sulfur atom, remember it's going to get an iodine from NIS, thereby becoming positive, giving us our lovely carbenium ion. I'm going to only draw one of the resonance structures because this is where that protecting group comes in. Notice at the C2 position, that acetyl group, we have a very nucleophilic ketone that's going to nuke in to the anomeric carbon, bumping electrons onto the endocyclic oxygen, thereby giving us resonance structures. This neighboring group intermediate effectively creates a blockade at the bottom face of this carbohydrate. So a glycosyl acceptor, it's going to be easier for it to attack from the top face and not the bottom. So we'll see predominantly the beta linkage formed in this glycosylation. We will see some alpha, but not a whole lot. This concept is called neighboring group participation. It can help us drive more of the beta linkage to be formed in a glycosylation. Now, there's another concept that can do the opposite. It can preferentially drive formation of an alpha glycosidic linkage. In order to illustrate this principle, we're going to use our same friend, beta D-glucose, with the thiophenyl group, except for rather than use acetyl groups as our protecting groups, we're using benzyl groups. I'm going to skip a few steps like I did last time and just throw the iodine atom onto our sulfur thereby causing the endocyclic oxygen to kick down electrons and boot the leaving group. Our oxocarbenium ion results, and so when a glycosyl acceptor comes to attack the intermediate, you might think it could only attack from the top face and not the bottom because of the extremely bulky phenyl substituent. However, this is not the case. Instead, we're going to see some alpha linkage produced. We're going to see a lot of it produced. We're going to see some beta linkage that will be formed, but it will predominant be, predominantly be the alpha linkage that is created during this glycosylation. Now, the principle that explains this is called the anomeric effect. And there are a couple ways scientists have tried to rationalize this phenomenon. One theory is based upon dipole-dipole minimizations between the electrons on the endocyclic oxygen and that on the hydroxyl group on the C1 carbon or anomeric carbon. These dipoles cancel, whereas in the beta linkage, the orientation of the hydroxyl group is almost the same as the lone pairs in the endocyclic oxygen, and this creates a little bit of a negative charge, which is not thermodynamically favorable. Therefore, the molecule with no dipole, the alpha linkage, is preferred. Another theory that helps describe this phenomena has to do with molecular orbital theory. So, if we look at this endocyclic oxygen, it has two lone pairs, and these two lone pairs are in orbitals. Now, some individuals believe that there's hyperconjugation between the endocyclic oxygen's electrons into an anti-bonding orbital at the anomeric carbon thereby making the electrochemically more stable linkage. Okay, now that we have all of that under our belt, we can finally return to our fictitious project involved in synthesizing isobamios. We're going to keep the same building blocks, the same glucose and trihalose building blocks, but protecting groups are going to differ on the glucose molecules. Our reagents will stay the same. We'll have the same n iodosacinamide activating agent and we'll keep our Lewis acid, triflic acid to be exact. And let's not forget we're going to need solvents. Our major product at the bottom is going to be alpha linkages and up top we're going to get mostly beta. The acetyl group is going to drive formation of the beta linkage through neighboring group participation. Remember that folks? I hope so. Down bottom, we're going to rely on the anomeric effect to get mostly alpha linkage. Now, it's important to note that no matter what, we're going to get some of both linkages formed in each reaction. It's just inevitable. Now, I hope you enjoyed watching, and now you know a little bit more about carbohydrate chemistry.